I hadn't seen Mike in a few months. He'd been buried in work, and our usual weekend nights out had all but disappeared. Then he called me on a Thursday and invited me over for drinks. I jumped at the invite, but I took note of how depressed he sound on the phone. By the time I got there, Mike had already started drinking and was slurring his words pretty badly. A dark cloud seemed to hover over him, which got worse when he drank. I finally asked what had been going on with him, and Mike turned even darker. Afraid, he said it had to do with work. I never really knew what Mike did for a living. I did know that he worked for the city in the tech department, and was involved in the CCTV surveillance network. But I never knew what his day-to-day -day was like, which he began to describe in detail. Mike explained that there were thousands of cameras scattered throughout the downtown area, the outlying neighborhoods, as well as in the suburbs of our million-plus people city. His responsibility was to categorize and archive all the incoming footage. Most of the footage went into a very general classification and was saved to a hard drive and identified with a lengthy combination of numbers and letters for categorically archiving them. They were truly meant to be forgotten about. It was a pretty expansive task, but Mike had designed and built an AI screening program that detected common patterns in footage, which selected out anomalous behaviors for later scrutiny. He said the vast majority wasn't even noteworthy. Something like 99.9% .9 was just trash. Then, of course, there was the 0.1%. The car accidents, the assaults, the swarmings, the abductions, the murders, those went into a special archive for use in criminal investigations. And then there was the even more exclusive 000.001%. These were held in a classification archive that contained footage of captured events that were, from all accounts, unexplainable. This was called the Tartarus Archive. I looked up the word Tartarus after and discovered that it was one of the darkest, deepest prisons in Greek mythology. It was said that if you dropped an anvil from heaven, it would take seven days for it to reach the earth. It would take another seven days for the anvil to reach Tartarus. It was the place they had put the Titans when they had found that nowhere else could contain them. As it turned out, the name was quite fitting for the archives. Some of the footage could be simplified to strange optical anomalies in the camera and coincidences of light, or a crackhead on a bender going through the subway system. Other footage, though, other footage defied logic. The others are what captured Mike's mind that evening. He'd been breaking protocol and bringing hard drives home at night. In fact, he'd been splicing the footage together, capturing and compiling repeat aberrations, and editing them into a linear sequence. Mike wanted to show me some. It wasn't in a bragging or showing off kind of way, either. It felt more like the sharing of a heavy burden. I asked if showing me would get him in trouble, but he waved the idea away. I said, yeah, obviously I want to see what's going on in the city. Mike led me into his workroom. There was a monitor and a tower and a pile of externals set up. We sat down and he skimmed through some drives nervously. Then he landed on one. Mike told me this anomaly was codenamed Lincoln Spectre. He pressed play. On the large screen, Black and white footage started up, showing me Lincoln Avenue, one of our less active downtown streets, at 3 a.m. The camera angle showed me the length of Lincoln Avenue as it led into the downtown core. The street appeared to be empty and quiet. From a side road, a woman emerged, walking towards the camera. As she approached the intersection, she turned over her shoulder and appeared to scream. The woman took off, spreading past the camera, which cut to a new, wide angle from another camera across the street. We watched the woman running frantically, seeming to be chased, but she was the only one on the street. There was no one else anywhere near her. The woman kept screaming as she ran, and the camera kept following, cutting between different CCTV angles. We watched as the woman was chased in the middle of an empty intersection. She fell then, cowering as if something massive was standing over her. The woman's neck stiffened, and she began to levitate off the ground suddenly. Her body looked like a rag doll as something lifted her by the throat until she was floating a dozen feet above the road in the middle of the intersection. Then the woman's head snapped to the left and her body fell back to the ground. The video ended and went black. I was shocked. Mike saw my expression and said, you ain't seen nothing yet. I asked if what I had seen was real, if that was unaltered raw footage. And Mike said that all he had done was put the clips together. Hell, none of the content had been touched. He told me the accident ended up being written up as a hit and run, and the case was left figuratively open for more evidence to amass, which it never would. The department kept footage hidden, 
claiming it was a camera malfunction. No one outside of Mike and his boss had seen the video, and how the poor woman had actually died. I started to understand the error of sombrance Mike was carrying around. Mike started the next video. This one was codenamed Black Crab, and was much longer than the previous one. It started in the subway system, at the underground Walkley station, shortly after closing up for the night. Walkley was the last stop on the route, and the exterior was shouldered by a new housing development on one side, and an untouched forest and swampland on the other. The camera was pointed down along the subway platform on the east side, and it showed its entire length with benches and garbage cans populating it. At the far end of the tunnel, there was only darkness. The lights on the platform shut off and the station went black. The camera switched to night vision and everything became more visible. My eyes trained on the platform waiting for something to happen. Finally there was movement. It was coming from the tunnel. It was difficult to identify what exactly it was at first since the movements were strange and the footage was grainy. But it got closer to the camera and I got a better look. It resembled a human, a man, but he was walking on his hands and feet upside down, with his back arched and his stomach pointing to the ceiling. He had long dark hair that dragged along the ground, and he wore the tattered layers of an old jacket and torn pants. He moved like a crab, jerkily yet quickly, and despite his posture, he made his way easily up the stairs. The footage cut to a new camera in the dark hallway leading to the stairs out of the station. We watched the crab walker claw up two steps at a time, and then crawl over the turnstile and towards the exit footage cut again, now showing the exterior of the train station. The crab walker squeezed and twisted and maneuvered his body through the locked and closed entrance. It looked impossible to accomplish, but he managed it. Once outside, the crab walker eyed his surroundings before skittering off towards the woods and disappearing. The footage cut to an hour later and revealed the crab walker reappearing from the woods. He was dragging a small animal by the tail in his teeth. It looked like a cat. Crabwalker squeezed back through the gate, crawled through the station, and disappeared into the tunnel again. Mike saw my expression and told me that there was more. He showed me the length of the video, which was over an hour. Mike had compiled over 20 sequences of the Crabwalker creeping out of the subway station and into the woods. Mike skimmed through the videos towards the end, and we watched the Crabwalker coming out of a sewer in the downtown alleyway. It crawled over to a pile of garbage bags and cardboard boxes. Then it jumped onto them and some kind of vicious frenzy ensued. There was someone else in the pile of garbage. Hands and feet thrashed about as they were struggling for their life. Then the movement stopped and the hands and feet went still. The crab walker's body moved jerkily about, but I couldn't see what was happening because of the darkness and all the garbage bags and boxes obscuring the camera view. Mike leaned over to me and whispered that the crab walker was eating a homeless man. This caused a criminal investigation as the dead body was found mutilated and festering in the open alleyway. Mike followed up on the inquiry. What he discovered was the crab walker who authorities believed to be a man named David Fletcher. Decades ago, David had been a prominent lawyer with a family. One Christmas, there was a huge fire and his wife and kids were killed in the blaze. It was David's fault. He had lost everything, including his mind, it seemed. Everyone has a breaking point whether they know it or not, a place where they've been too far and then snap. David had apparently found his. Family and friends described his descent as nightmarish. David lived on the street, becoming addicted to drugs and tumbling into mental illness. The last anyone knew of him was from 10 years prior. He'd thrown himself in front of a subway at the Walkie Station, and no one had heard from him since. It appeared that somehow David had survived the subway hit, his back had broken and healed, oddly, causing him to move the way he did. He'd adapted to the new posture and lived in the darkness of the subway for years, finding sustenance from drain water and wild animals that he caught. That was what Mike found out, at least, but then he said that was just the answer the investigators gave at Discovery. Who knew where the truth actually lay? Mike said there was always an answer for the videos he found. Whether the answers were true or not, no one knew, but the ones that had become public all needed explanations, however absurd. Either way, David was never found and didn't reappear on the subway footage. Mike plugged in a new hard drive. He poured a fresh drink and told me this was the one that had troubled him. The file was codenamed Cloud Mirror. I 
wasn't honestly sure I wanted to see it, but before I could object, Mike had pressed play. All the monitors lit up with footage from different intersections downtown, on the exact date and time of each other. There were five in total. The streets on each of the screens were empty and quiet. No cars, no people. Suddenly, at the exact time, in the center of the intersection, a small glow pulsed into existence. It was some kind of orb, roughly the size of a bowling ball. The streetlights around it pulsed with energy waves as the orb grew larger. It grew to the size of a beach ball, then it flashed out. The streetlights went back to normal, and the intersection was as lifeless as it had been before. I asked Mike what had happened. He told me he had gigs of footage of the orb and had watched them repeatedly. He didn't know what they were. At first, they had just started by chance. Mike clicked on the next video, and again, five monitors lit up with the strange intersection and time of night, but it was several weeks later. The streetlights glowed and pulsed, and an orb manifested into existence again. It grew to its beach ball size, but then it altered the surface. Something gas-like replaced it, growing outward into a couch-sized cloud of deep gray. One of the cameras was closer, so I got to see the small cloud in detail. It looked like a volcanic eruption wrapping around itself. They were large, constantly morphing blobs that curled around from the glowing center, resembling a mandelbulb fractal as a gaseous-based organism. It was fascinating to see them floating in the middle of the street, so alien to our roads and stoplights and street lamps. Then they began to move, gliding down empty roads, the cameras cut to different angles, following the clouds on some unknown paths, zigging and zagging into new streets and through alleyways. Then they stopped. The clouds hovered in the center of the intersection. They lowered to ground level, standing straight up like a large coffin. Holding rigid to their shapes, their, their exteriors continued to shift and mold together like magnets made of smoke. Something on one of the monitors caught my eye. Down the street, people appeared. They'd seen the clouds and were walking towards it. The group looked drunk and fascinated by the floating entities, so much so that they approached it. As they did, the clouds became brighter. The street lamps began to pulse. The group were in some kind of a trance, staring into the morphic blob. One of the group, a guy, stared into it like a zombie, then walked right into the cloud and disappeared. None of the group tried to stop him. Instead, another one followed him in and another, and another. All five members of the group disappeared into the cloud. Then they reappeared, one at a time. The first guy, and then in the order they came in. Only, they weren't stumbling or boisterous or drunk now. They were walking upright, using minimal movements. They formed into a perfect five-person circle for several seconds after quick words, then turned and all went in separate directions. Their strides and arm swings were all sped up to match. Another monitor showed a similar situation with a large group of people, lost in revelry as they marched one after another into the cloud. Each monitor showed the same thing, people entering the clouds and coming back out different. Mike stopped the video. I asked him if he'd shown this to anyone. He said he hadn't, not even to his boss, which was a problem because he had a meeting with his boss in the morning to discuss the missing footage. I asked why he didn't show the footage to his boss. This footage seemed more serious. People were being replaced by something. Mike sighed and put a new video on. The main monitor lit up and showed a new downtown street. The date was from earlier this week and one of the clouds was floating in the intersection. A middle-aged couple was walking nearby, the husband with a slight limp on his right leg. The couple saw the clouds and were sucked in by their aura. They approached it, eyes wide and mouths open. Both husband and wife entered the cloud and disappeared. After a moment, they reappeared and the husband's limp was magically gone. Mike turned to me and said, that was my boss and his wife. We used to have to take the corpses out with a crane, he told me once, because they were so intertwined. Entire pyramids of bodies, people climbing on top of one another, clawing each other to get away from the gas. They used to tell us it was a quick death, but everyone knew it wasn't. The screaming in the chamber would go on for 15 or 20 minutes. 
They used to put a little glass window in the door so the doctor could look in and watch. My grandfather, Alexander, had told me about his time in the Zonderkommando, the corpse units of the National Socialist concentration camps. He had been arrested in Poland simply because he'd been a leader in his field and an intellectual with a history of supporting Polish nationalism. This had raised red flags, and during a roundup of the intelligentsia, my grandfather had also been arrested and tortured by the Gestapo. They had made him sign something that he never got to read. Then he had been moved to prison and, eventually, to his new job. The day it happened, my friend Bartok and I were on duty. Our job was to lead the people towards the chambers without alerting them or causing a riot. The Zonderkommandos are used lines like, Don't forget where you put your clothes because you'll need to come back to them, or tie your shoes together for convenience to make it easier to find them when you come back. We always emphasized how they would come back after the shower, but I never looked them in the eye when I said it. He stared out the window for a long moment after this, his mug of coffee steaming in front of him. I knew not to interrupt him. He often talked to me about his experiences. It seemed like he wanted to draw poison out of his memories, and letting him talk seemed to help him do it. So the chamber was packed, as always. Eight hundred people smashed into a tiny area, like sardines. To get the last one in, the SS would often beat and bludgeon people. The claustrophobia must have been horrifying. The lack of air, the packed chamber, like a massive coffin. By the time they slammed the door closed, there wasn't an extra inch of space into the entire chamber. In fact, after they opened the door, the bodies would often still be standing, because there was simply no room for them to fall down except for the middle of the chamber, of course. There, people lived the longest. They tried to escape from the gas. We would see infants and small children at the bottom of human pyramids, smothered and stampeded. The stronger ones would be at the top, having climbed over the bodies of others to try and get some air at the top of the chamber. The gas did have a tendency to fall, depending on the temperature and the humidity. When they opened the doors, Bartok and I walked in among the others of the Zonderkommando. We used long canes to pull the bodies out. At first, a Zonderkommando would treat the bodies with respect, but after tens of thousands of bodies, you just started throwing them like bags of potatoes. It was our job, after all. He said it with an ironic misery, his eyes getting misty. Bartok and I would then pile the bodies on carts as we brought them to the other teams of Zonderkommandos. One team, which we called the dentists, would rip out the gold teeth so they could melt them down into bars and send them back to Germany. Another would shave all the remaining hair off the corpses. They'd shaved them when they first got there, but any remainder would make the crematorium reek of burning hair. Bartok and I were moving our carts of corpses up the lift elevator when a commotion suddenly broke out in a nearby medical barracks. They called it a medical barracks, but in reality it was mostly a place where doctors experimented on people, where the sick were often given lethal doses of this chemical or that. This also wasn't a quick death, as the person would begin to get agonizing cramps and a burning sensation before devolving into unconsciousness. I had no idea what was going on. First, I thought the SS were trying to prevent a prisoner escape, or maybe someone had already escaped and they were in an uproar. It looked like someone had kicked a hornet's nest. I saw government vehicles speeding in with fully armed troops. The guards surrounded the gates of the camp, a thick ring of black-suited soldiers. I saw a doctor running out of the barracks, blood covering his white lab coat. 
His eyes looked wild, and he screamed something in German to the soldiers. He kept screaming it over and over again. Die, Wolfen! Die, Wolfen! he said. Most of the Zonder commandos, including myself, knew at least a little German. It was, after all, the administrative language of the National Socialist State, and the Germans never deigned to speak to us in our language, unless they were torturing us or trying to get information. By this time, Bartok and I had paused, a cart full of emaciated naked corpses lying in front of us. The doctor ran past us, not noticing, his eyes wild. He continued to scream gibberish in German, speaking so fast I could barely understand anything except for two words, the girl and the wolf. What the hell do you think that's about? Bartok asked me, his blue eyes wide and uncertain. I just shook my head, feeling numb. I hadn't felt much of anything in months, to be honest. I had closed myself down emotionally, psychologically removing myself from the present. I saw much of this as if it were happening to someone else. In my mind, I think I was trying to protect myself. Even now, looking back, I feel like I'm telling someone else's story sometimes. A torrent of gunfire erupted from the medical barracks, and then a woman ran out. It was a nurse, and her face looked like a mask of gore. One eye hung limply from its socket, and her entire left cheek was hung down in ribbons, a flap of skin revealing the teeth behind some sort of grotesque half-smile. In her remaining eye, I saw mortal terror and fear. Seeing it coming from our captors loosened something inside me. Bartok felt the same way. We left our carts of dead and turned to run. At that moment, something tore its way out of the barracks. As I saw what it was, I began running with all the energy that my starving body could provide. It was a girl. At least, it had been. She looked no older than twelve or thirteen, and she wore a striped uniform, soaked in blood. Her arms and legs lengthened before my eyes, forming long claws that erupted from her fingers. Her mouth had formed into a strange ricked to grin, with drops of blood falling from her sharpening teeth. Stringy black hair seemed to be growing from her head, and her eyes, her eyes, they were turning yellow, with slitted demonic pupils gleaming in the center, emanating a bloodlust and fury that I'd never seen before. The SS guards and soldiers had streamed in from the front gate by this point, running at her and shouting orders. Automatic rifles began to fire, and Bartok grabbed my hand and pulled me down to the ground just in time. I heard bullets whizzing over my head, smashing into the crematorium chimney and the surrounding barracks. I knew they weren't shooting at me, but so many soldiers had opened fire that the entire area had turned into a shooting gallery. I looked back and saw bullets ripping into the girl's body. Gore blossomed from her chest, blood and flesh exploding out of exit wounds, covering the bare dirt around her. With a roar, she jumped on top of the barracks, leaping twenty feet into the air. To my amazement, I watched the wounds healing before my eyes. I wondered what kind of strange medical experiment this was, that could produce such an effect. Bartok shook me, saying we had to run, we had to get out, but I just stood there, shell-shocked. He slapped me, pulling me up and towards the gas chamber. We can barricade ourselves inside the chamber, he said. I gasped. I'm not going to lock myself in there, I shouted, waves of anxiety rising in my chest. I had images of the door slamming closed and Zyklon B being poured through the vents. I shuddered, but 
We kept running towards it, not knowing where else to go. As we got inside the crematoria, the windows smashed inward, and I saw the girl had followed us. She'd completely transformed by this point. Her skin looked yellow and papery against the long, wolfish frame. Tatters of the blood-stained uniform still clung to her body. I saw no marks from where the bullets had struck her. She ran towards us, lashing out with clawed hands. Bartok pushed me just in time, and I fell, the claw missing my face by a fraction of an inch. I began to crawl away, looking back at Bartok as he began to cry out in terror. I looked and saw him backing away from her, his hands raised, pleading. I don't want to die. I don't want to die, he kept saying. In a blur, she leapt forward, ripping at his throat, the bloody rictus grin still plastered across her face. A torrent of blood rushed out from the gaping wound, soaking the front of his body. She opened her mouth wide and drank the spouting arterial stream, sucking at it as she held up his body with her clawed hands. When she was done, she threw it aside and looked down at me. I had begun to rise, to jump up and run when she tackled me from behind. I felt a searing pain in my back as her claws connected, leaving deep gouges. I felt something sticky and warm flowing down my back, soaking into the rips in my uniform. At that point, a dozen SS men ran in through the front door and began shooting. I was on the floor after she had clawed me, which turned out to be lucky, as the bullets went right over me. Hissing and spitting blood, I turned my head at the last moment to see the girl galloping away from me on all fours, her freakish long arms giving her a lopsided stride. She jumped back through the shattered window she'd come in. The SS men all ran out after her, and I found myself alone with Bartok's body. I got up and found the rest of the prisoners confined to their barracks with armed guards watching each of the groups. The guards had left the front of the camp in a hurry, and I saw that the gates stood wide open. With blood pouring down my back, I began to creep through the shadows of the camp, checking the watchtowers and the front gates for people. They had all joined in the pursuit, or were with the confined prisoners in their barracks, and they had apparently forgotten about a lone Zonder commando like myself. I finally made my way outside. I didn't see a single other prisoner or guard in the front. But when I looked back, before I left for the final time, I saw the girl leaping over the razor wire fence as countless soldiers pursued her. Good for you, I said to myself. Good for you. Don't get drunk and break into the cemeteries in New Orleans. And if you do, don't piss off any of the tombs with a bunch of X marks all over it. I did that six days ago, Saturday, and I've died every day since. After leaving the cemetery that night, I stubbed my foot stepping out on the curve and broke my neck on a wall outside a bar. I dreamed of a woman that night. She wore a white dress and stared at me. But I couldn't have dreamed anything. Do the dead dream? Sunday morning, I woke up in my bed with no hangover. I had a clear head, which was rare for me in the morning, but the details of the night before were a little hazy. I checked myself out in the mirror, but didn't see any signs of damage. I remember tripping on the curve, then the wall of the bar rushing up towards me. I was so drunk that I didn't put out my hand to catch myself. Then, only blackness. Pushing the thought away, I started my day. I left my apartment and walked down the block to the corner diner. Most mornings, I needed coffee to chase away my hangover. No hangover that morning, but the craving was still there. I sat at the counter and ordered. A tall, very dark-skinned man was sitting at the counter. 
He was dressed in an old-fashioned dark purple suit. He had coattails and all. He stood as I sat down and said good morning and made his way out of the diner. Be seeing you later, he said to the diner. Everyone ignored him. I turned and looked at him as the door was slowly swishing shut. He tipped his hat to me as he was putting it on. His smile was yellow like his eyes. As the door swung shut, I could see him lighting a cigar. I think he winked at me. After my coffee, I walked over to Jackson Square. Maybe the fortune teller could tell me something. They all turned me down. The real ones did, at least. You can tell which ones are real. After the failure, I walked back towards the river. A carriage horse got spooked by some tourists lighting firecrackers and caved in the side of my head with a kick. Monday, I woke up again in my bed. This was really happening. I searched the news, but there were no stories about a horse killing one on Decatur Street. I gave in and decided that the only thing for me was to get nice and drunk. I was sober for a whole day. That was an accomplishment for me. Well, sober for a morning at least. That night, I tied one on. I couldn't get enough. At one point, I think I remember that tall guy from the diner buying me a drink. What was this? I asked as he handed me a double shot of something dark. Oh, it's always rum for me, baby, he said before throwing back his shot. I didn't care. I would have drunk anything that night. Be seeing you around, he said, before fading into the crowd of the bar. I was shot in the back while walking home. They killed me for the nine dollars I had in my pocket. In my dreams that night, the lady in white was sitting on a short stool with her back towards me. I walked towards her, but... She never turned around. No matter how close I got to her, no matter how far I stretched my hand, I couldn't touch her. Tuesday, I decided to stay in. If I didn't go out, I couldn't die, right? My thought was to drink a fifth of vodka and try to take a bath. I must have passed out because when I came to, the water was freezing. I slipped getting out of the tub and bashed my head on the rim of the toilet. I still couldn't reach the woman in white. She was working with something in her lap. Every time I walked around to her front to see what she was doing, I would just be looking at her back again. Wednesday, I believed the bed would be my sanctuary. Surely nothing bad can happen to you in bed. Things were going well until I smelled the smoke and heard the sirens. The fire must have started in an apartment below me. I threw open my front door and ran for the stairs. They collapsed as I made my way to the landing. Since I was on the top floor, I had nowhere to go. Resigned, I walked back inside. People were staggering out of my building onto the street below. A crowd formed across the street, and some of them were pointing up at my window. The tall man was standing amongst them, smiling up at me. He tipped his hat as my floor collapsed, and I fell into the inferno below. I found out what the woman in white was working with. This time, she was standing. She had a dead chicken in her hand. With a quick motion, she twisted and wrenched the head from the bird. She began chanting and moved in a circle, making a ring of blood on the ground around her. I called to her, but she ignored me. Right before I woke up, she glanced up at me, glaring into my eyes. By Thursday, I'd given up. Whatever was happening to me was out of my control. My room was like it always was. No sign of a fire... As soon as I got up, I went straight for Bourbon Street, because the bars never closed there. With an empty stomach, I got to work. Even on Bourbon Street, drunks aren't well tolerated before noon. After getting kicked out of the third bar, I sat down on the curb with a big-ass beer. The tall man sat down beside me. We were quiet for a few minutes before I asked him, Why is this happening to me? Now, now, don't worry about that, Cher. Just a few more days and it'll all be over. Now, if you hurry, there's a party bus carrying a bachelorette party about to cross Bourbon Street just a few blocks that way. He pointed down the street. The driver is a man a lot like you. He's out way too late last night and might not have all his faculties about him. I nodded and stood up. The tall man called to me as I walked away. Au revoir, mon ami. The bus plowed right through the stop sign. He was right. The driver never saw me. The bus squealed to a halt too late. With me, 
trapped underneath. I could smell my skin melting on the scalding undercarriage. The driver ran out and saw what he'd done. He turned away and vomited as the party rushed out of the bus to see what was happening. A pretty lady wearing a sash that read Bride saw me and dropped her tall green novelty drink. The last thing I heard was the screams of her and her bridesmaids. The woman in white walked towards me in a dreamy way that night. She held a dusty bottle with no label that was full of some kind of dark liquor. She stood in front of me and took a big pull from the bottle. With a look of disdain, she held the bottle out to me. I reached for it, but she pulled it away and spat the liquor in my face. She began chanting something in French Creole and walked around me in a circle, stopping periodically to tease me by holding the bottle out in front of her. Every time I reached for the bottle, she would pull it away, take another swig, and spit it back in my face. Her chanting continued in between her taunts. Finally, she stopped and stared at me with hatred. Time to wake up, fool, she said. It wasn't English, but I understood her. She took one more long pull from the bottle, blood beginning to dribble from between her lips, and spewed it back onto me. I shot up from my sleep and was horrified to find my face and chest covered in blood. I cleaned myself up and spent the rest of the day wandering aimlessly around my apartment. Eventually I headed out and walked around the corner until late into the night. The tall man would be waiting for me in the doorway or the window of a bar, always with a shot of rum held out for me. I just ignored him and walked on. Well after midnight, near the edge of the corridor, I saw her waiting for me on a distant street corner. Last chance, mon cher, said the tall man from the doorway of a quiet bar. The bar was dark because it was closing up. It was hard to make out the details of his face, but it looked like he was wearing white paint in the shape of a crude skull. I took the offered shot and drank it down slowly, savoring the burn. She rounded the corner, and I followed. As I walked, I lost sight of her, but she would always be there when I turned a corner or a car passed by, just standing and staring at me from a distance. Eventually, I found myself walking next to the tall white wall. An opening in the wall revealed a huge, ornate iron gate. I stopped at the gate, and it slowly swung open, creaking on its centuries-old hinges. Of course, back where this all began, the cemetery. My feet carried me down the boulevard of this miniature city of the dead. She was gone again, so I scanned the side alleys for her. I saw a flash of her white dress between the crumbling tombs, so I ventured deeper into the cemetery after her. She was waiting for me next to a tomb. The tall man stood with her. When I stopped in front of them, he turned and removed the name plaque from one of the open crypts. The stale air that billowed out smelled of musty decay. He bowed low and gestured me inside. I began to weep, but I still climbed in. I turned onto my back in the tight space and looked up. He smiled at me and said, It's been a pleasure, truly. He lifted the plaque back up and sealed me inside, covering me in sweet darkness. Finally, I can rest. My name's John. I'm in my 20s and I just moved out of my parents' house. I'm in search of lower cost living and I decided to move to a small town in Rainville Bay, southwest Michigan. It's one of those American towns you see in movies, spaced out houses, all built similarly. Most of the residents are elderly, making it very quiet for most of the year. No noisy parties, speeding cars, or anything like that, which I particularly love. However, shortly after moving, I noticed something weird. My neighbor, Mr. Anderson, has a peculiar habit of lighting a candle every night, religiously, at about 11.50 p.m., and placing it in his window. He stands there for about 15 minutes, gazing at it, and then he goes to sleep. On nights of strong wind or rain, he tends to shield it with something similar to a lantern. My curiosity was piqued, and I really wanted to know what it was all about. Was it a superstition? Uh 
local tradition, ancient enough for only the oldest or elderliest to remember. I don't even know how to ask him about it. I briefly mentioned it to an elderly woman, Mrs. Percy, a very kind neighbor who often shows up at my door with sweets and cakes. When I asked, however, she simply changed the subject, and this has happened more than once. One day, gathering my courage to approach Mr. Anderson directly, I walked up to his door and knocked. He opened with a friendly enough smile, and I hesitantly started asking him about the candle. He listened to my question, and for a moment, his eyes seemed pretty distant, as if recalling something. Then, he simply told me it was a family tradition, nothing for me to worry about. Unsatisfied with the vague answer, I tried to insist for more details, but he politely closed the door, saying he preferred to keep family traditions a secret. I was frustrated, but my curiosity only grew. I decided to search for information at the small cultural center in town, hoping to find some record that explained the tradition or someone who could shed some light on it. However, my efforts were in vain. The files were scarce, and the few available details on Ranival Bay didn't mention anything about lighting candles. I tried talking to the officials who handled the center, but they acted similarly to Mrs. Percy. Gradually, all this denial of information became an obsession for me. I waited all night by the window, just waiting for the moment when he would light his candle. On a holiday eve, I even stayed up all night to see if the candle could go out or when he would remove it. He removed it at exactly 5.55 a.m. I was running out of ideas. For a while, I even kept an eye on the neighbors' houses, watching if they would do the same. For some reason, only Mr. Anderson had this habit. With few options left, I went for my emergency plan. On that day, at exactly 11.50, I placed a candle in my window and lit it. It had been an intense work day, and I really needed to sleep, but I just couldn't. I sat in an uncomfortable chair in my room, facing the candle to avoid falling asleep. It didn't work so well because, slowly, Orpheus called me with his sweet song, leading me to Hypnos's arms. I relaxed, unconscious, when I heard a noise that made me jump from my chair. It was Knox, something hitting against the wood, the wood of my door. I looked through the window and saw Mr. Anderson at my doorstep. He knocked once more. I need to come in, he shouted. Let me in. I rushed down the stairs, still confused with everything. I approached the door as the pleas intensified, but when I reached the door, about to grab the handle, something triggered my instinct. I felt there was something wrong, and... I decided to check before opening. I approached the peephole, staring at the one who disturbed my sleep. He was there, the familiar neighbor, but different. His mouth was open in an unconventional angle. His voice didn't come from his lips. It seemed to emanate from the black hole that was his mouth. His eyes darted frantically from side to side, unfocused on anything. From his chin, a thick foam dripped, forming puddles on the floor. His arms were bleeding and twisted, seemed crushed by the wood. Judging by the way they contorted, the blows intensified, almost as if the door was about to come off its hinges. I ran to one of the cabinets and pushed it to block the passage. It went on like that till about 5.50 a.m. I wondered why no neighbors had woke up with all this racket. I saw him through the window returning to his home, entering at exactly 5.55 a.m appearing at his window to remove the candle. The rest of the day was a nightmare. I was sleep-deprived and had to drink about five cups of coffee to make it through the workday. The sleepless night left me like a human wreck. I had to go to work in that state, and the fifth cup of coffee in my hand felt like an illusionary comfort as I tried to stay awake. I couldn't help but think about the events of the previous night, the image of Mr. Anderson desperately banging on my door, haunting my thoughts with every blink. At the end of the workday, I decided I needed to understand what was going on. I took the way back home, nervous and tense. The town was shrouded in a peculiar silence, and the lights of the house hummed faintly. The street was deserted, with no signs of life besides me and the small details that made up the landscape. 
like the occasional passing car or barking dog. As I approached the home, I spotted Mr. Anderson in the distance. A wave of terror hit me, and I thought about turning back, avoiding the inevitable encounter. However, something inside me insisted that I needed to face the situation. He was walking slowly towards me, completely normal. His friendly and welcoming smile was back, in contrast to the hole that had been his mouth the night before. He waved when our eyes met. The scene was so distinct from the disturbing image of the previous night that I almost questioned my own sanity. "'Afternoon, John,' he greeted, as if nothing had happened. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Anderson,' I replied, trying to keep calm even though my heart was still racing. I hoped he would mention something about the previous night, but he continued the conversation as if nothing was different. We talked about the weather, the neighborhood, trivial things that made no sense in the face of the terrible experience we had shared. I was eager to get inside, past him, and went in, but before closing the door, I couldn't help but ask, Mr. Anderson, are you okay? He frowned as if trying to remember, but shrugged. Oh, the usual young man, a backache here and there, but nothing major. I didn't know what to think. His answer was so casual as if, as if I were imagining things. He greeted me, and I saw that there weren't any scars, let alone wounds on his hands or arms. Could it have been my imagination? Unfortunately not. I'm well aware of that now, because night after night, he comes to scream at my window, saying he needs to come in, regardless of whether I have a candle lit or not. Believe me, I've tried both solutions with no result. Really... Starting to get used to it, it wouldn't be such a big problem till yesterday. I was setting up the desk to block the door as usual. I had already put the furniture on standby when Mr. Anderson started his noisy night. I was about to go to my room, put on my headphones, and get some sleep when I passed the staircase. The staircase facing the back door, and... Then, while my neighbor screamed desperately that he needed to come in, I heard a single knock on the door in front of me. Since I lit a candle in my window, my neighbors ask every night for me to let them in, and now there's something knocking on my back door, too. Miss Fiora, can you please come to school as soon as possible? Miss Morgan, the school guidance counselor, asked. Julian isn't hurt, but he's in a very serious situation. When I asked what happened, Miss Morgan said it was better to explain when I arrived. Bewildered and unnerved, I feared the worst when speculating what my eight-year-old might have done. Julian could sometimes be a bit unruly at home, but never once got in any trouble at school. Julian's teachers loved him, and he appeared to get along with all of his classmates, which made this so unusual. Despite pondering every conceivable scenario during the drive, I never would have guessed what my son had ultimately done in a million years. My stomach sank when I saw an ambulance and a trio of police cruisers in front of the school. After parking in the visitor's parking lot, I was greeted by Mrs. Morgan, Mr. Quatero, Julian's teacher, Mrs. Jones, the principal, and two police officers, one of whom happened to be my cousin, Brady. I noticed none of them looked angry, they all had the same disturbed looks of horror and disbelief across their face. Miss Fiora, thank you for coming so quickly, Miss Jones said. Where's my son? I asked anxiously. What did he do? He's with Miss Isbister right now, the school psychologist, Miss Jones quickly replied. Before I could ask any questions, Brady stepped forward and took me aside. Look, they figured it'd be best if I tell you what's going on, so brace yourself, Brady said softly, taking a breath before continuing. Julian brought a head to school. An actual human head. What? Was all I could gasp out, after not saying anything for a few seconds, unsure if I'd heard Brady correctly. He had it in his backpack. Did you see him leave the house today? I waited with him for the bus like I always do every morning. I was unsure if there was a hint of suspicion in Brady's voice. I had no reason to think anything out of the ordinary was going on. When I asked Brady what exactly happened, he motioned for Mr. Quatero, who slowly walked over to where I stood. Mr. Quatero was visibly distraught over the incident, as indicated by his trembling hand, 
ironically only having four fingers, when we briefly exchanged a shake. When Brady asked him to recount the happenings, Mr. Quatero swallowed nervously before beginning. The kids were supposed to have show and tell yesterday, but we just couldn't get to it in time. So I had them do it today before lunch, Mr. Quatero said, his face contorting with disgust while giving the account. When it was Julian's turn, he, he said he brought in a special friend. He just pulled it out of his pack like it was nothing in front of the whole class. Julian said the head was his... Uncle Milty, Brady added. He doesn't he doesn't have an Uncle Milty, I said, staring mystified at my cousin. Did he say where he found it? He said the head was growing from the ground in the woods behind your house. My blood ran cold and my mind started racing. I wasn't sure what rattled me more, Julian seeing and physically handling a human head, or the grim prospect that someone's remains were discarded a stone's throw away from where my family slept. Julian wasn't allowed in the woods bordering the backyard unsupervised, and even when permitted, knew he had to stay within view. When could he have made such a gruesome discovery without us knowing? Take me to my son. Julian was playing with Legos in Miss Isbester's office when I entered, seemingly unaware of the situation's severity. Miss Isbester said Julian was immediately brought here, while he and Mr. Quatero tried getting his class under control. When I asked if Julian explained why he did this, Mr. Isbister's answer sent a sharp chill down my spine. He said Uncle Milty told him to. Mr. Isbister let Brady and I speak with Julian alone in his office. My son was elated to see me, and seemed under the impression that this was some kind of special occasion. The innocent, unsuspecting look on his young face showed Julian appeared unaware that he'd done anything wrong, which for me made this ordeal extra difficult. Julian, do you know what's going on? I asked while sitting with him on the couch. Do you know why we're here right now? Julian's smile faded when he saw how concerned Brady and I looked. Julian, who's Uncle Milty? I asked when my son's eyes started to wander around the office. You don't have an uncle with that name. He lived in a hole behind our house, Julian said nonchalantly, appearing more interested in getting back to playing with the Legos. I'm helping him find a new home. Brady and I looked at each other, both of us visibly perturbed by Julian's answer. What do you mean, cuz, Brady said quickly, seeing that I was at a loss for words. Can you tell me exactly where you found the head? I mean, uh, Uncle Milty? Julian's smile returned. I was trying to find a ball I hit really hard into the woods, and... I found him sticking out of the ground. I knew the exact day Julian was referring to, this past Saturday afternoon. Julian and my husband had been playing baseball when he hit an absolute howitzer that sailed into the tree line. Although they spread out to find the ball, my husband said Julian was always within view. It took over half an hour for them to find it, and I do remember losing sight of them quite a few times while they searched. Julian must have found it then, I thought, becoming deeply unsettled when I imagined the naive look on his face when he made such a grisly discovery. Would you be able to show us where you found him? Brady asked. And did you take Uncle Milty with you the day you found him? Julian shook his head. I visited him again before he told me to take him. He lived where the woodpile used to be. Julian was talking about a large mound of firewood in our backyard. It took a few days, but my husband and I had relocated all the wood to another part of the yard. Its original location was a few yards into the tree line. We wanted to build a shed there, but wound up finding a better spot, despite clearing the area. I nodded at Brady, indicating I knew the exact spot Julian was describing. Julian, what do you mean when you said he told you to take him? Who are you talking to? Julian looked at Brady perplexed. Uncle Milty, he told me that... I could take him with me. So you've been talking to this Uncle Milty head, like how the three of us are talking right now? I asked, tightly pursing my lips when Julian nodded his affirmation. I don't know what I'd have said if someone told me earlier today my son would bring a human head into school that was also his imaginary friend. Mr. Isbister said Julian may have been severely traumatized by what he found, and imagined that the interactive qualities were a way of coping. When Julian was getting looked at by the school nurse, Brady took me to see if I recognized the head's face. The severed head was kept in an ice-filled cooler out in the ambulance. 
It was in a large, clear evidence bag, and looked to have only died fairly recently. I didn't recognize the man, who appeared to be in his thirties and had a bloated face with narrow cheeks, large black eyes, a Roman nose, thick pink lips, and short blonde hair. His eyes were still open, looking in different directions, and the mouth hung agape, its tongue partially protruding from between its teeth. The head's whitish beige skin had patches of mottling, darkened veins, proverbial deathly gray tints synonymous with corpses. I only looked long enough to verify I didn't recognize the man's face before having to suppress an upcoming urge to vomit. Julian was medically and physically evaluated before we were both interviewed by detectives at the police station. We didn't get home until later that night, and by then, a forensics team had already set up shop on my property. Brady kept me informed and was at my house monitoring the situation. The whole area in front of my home was quarantined off by yellow police tape, and jam-packed with a sundry of police vehicles. Brady and one of the detectives met me at the perimeter. I kept Julian near me while walking up to Brady and the other detective, who had me bring my son inside when we spoke. Our cadaver dogs instantly picked up a scent and brought us right to the spot your son mentioned. The detective, whose last name was Vendetto, began, We unearthed a shallow grave containing the remains of a body. A headless body. Despite largely expecting this, hearing someone confirm that it was actually real made it no easier to accept. There was a corpse buried on my property that nobody probably would have found if we hadn't moved a heaping woodpile. A decomposing body my son had the misfortune of discovering. No child is ever meant to experience those kinds of realities life offers at such a delicate age. Although Julian maintained a reserved exterior thus far, I shuddered to think what actual thoughts and impacts this experience might have on my son. If it really was where the old woodpile used to be, which was there before I ever bought the house, it had to have been there for a long time, right? I inquired, particularly emphasizing how the woodpile predated when my family lived at the house. Well, that's the thing, Brady replied, getting an approving nod from Detective Vendetto. Whoever's head Julian found has probably only been dead for seven or eight days tops. The other remains were buried there for a while, years probably. I squinted in confusion at Brady and the detective. So, they're looking for a body right now. There's two out there. Maybe not here, Detective Vendetto said. We haven't found any more remains yet, but we think someone might have dismembered and dispersed another body, whose head your son found. It didn't make any sense. There was no way the head Julian found and decapitated remains they discovered were the same person. But I couldn't chalk up Julian finding the head where a set of other remains lay as a coincidence. Without any substantial proof, however, we were only left to speculate. Despite a thorough search of the woods behind my house and surrounding area, no additional human remains were ever found. Since the body was on our property, we had to be formally cleared of any wrongdoing. While undergoing that process, more peculiar happenings occurred. Two days after the incident, Brady told me that the head Julian found went missing at the police station, seemingly disappeared overnight without a trace. One week later, Julian's teacher, Mr. Quattro, was killed. Only his severed head was discovered. The man's body was never found. My husband and I kept Julian out of school since that day, and were considering transferring him so he could have a fresh start. Hearing news of his teacher's demise, which I kept away from him, prompted us to go through with the move. Even before eventually selling the house, we packed up and relocated to a new town, Julian adjusting well, despite still receiving therapy to help him manage his understanding of what had happened. Always speaking of Uncle Milty and high regard, if he ever came up in the conversation. Our new home was closer to my job, and Julian made friends quickly at his new school. About three months passed since his show-and-tell incident. It was Julian's birthday, who I hadn't gotten a chance to call since my morning and early afternoon had been filled with back-to-back -back meetings and calls and appointments. I was already behind schedule and putting the final touches on a report that was 15 minutes past due. I heard my office door open, which I knew was my final appointment before lunch. Keeping my eyes glued to the computer screen, I told my client to sit tight for five minutes determined to have this write-up finished and sent before shifting gears. I heard him mutter something under his breath in a disgruntled tone before walking up to one of the chairs in front of my desk. 
While finishing the report, I pulled up my calendar to view my meeting details, since my assistant made some last-minute changes to the morning schedule and failed to specify what they were before going to lunch. Soon as the appointment opened on my screen, however, I heard the abrupt footsteps of the client walking towards the door. I'm so sorry about that. I didn't mean to be rude, but I was worried my inattentiveness may have rubbed him the wrong way, but I quickly pulled my eyes from the computer just as he was about to leave the office. I caught a long enough glimpse to remember his face, long and narrow with beady, sly-looking black eyes, reddish-pink lips that formed a half-smirk, a balding forehead, and short, dark hair. Adjusting his fleece-tall neck collar, he looked at me with disgust and disappointment before closing the door behind him with his hand. I quickly stood up and tried to gesture for the man to stay, kicking myself for being so inconsiderate and dreading the possible ramifications of this misstep. He looked oddly familiar, I thought while hurrying across my office. Hoping to catch him, I swung the door open, but he was already gone, stomping away in frustration. I slowly shut the door, thankful my assistant didn't witness my spectacle. Turning back to face my office, I froze after noticing a package on one of the chairs. It was a square box, about 14 by 14, and gift-wrapped in plaid red and green paper. There was a card taped to the top of the package, addressed to my son. Upon reading it, I was hit with a spinning lightheadedness when I remembered where I had previously seen that man's face. Dear Julian, wishing you a happy birthday as promised. Thank you again for helping me to get a new look. We'll talk soon, Uncle Milty. I stood there, holding the card in my shaky hands, constantly rereading the handwritten note inside of it, while trying to comprehend who was just in my office. However, it wasn't his face being that of a severed head Julian had found, which had filled me with paralyzing terror. The man's hands he'd used to shut the office door behind him with only had four fingers. <laughs>